Good morning and welcome to the first Encompass Live of 2022. Welcome to a new year. Yay. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. <laughs> But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and it is then posted on our website for you to watch at your convenience. Um, and I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our recordings. Both our live show and the archive recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries, uh, similar to a state library. Uh, so we provide services to all types of libraries in the state. So uh, we will have shows on Encompass Live that could be um, for any type of library, uh, public, academic, K-12, uh, corrections, archives, museums, um, anything and everything. Really, our only criteria is that it is something to do with libraries. Uh, we do book reviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, um, all sorts of things. We have guest speakers that come in um, to do presentations for us sometimes from around the country, around Nebraska and around the country. Um, but we also have Nebraska Library Commission staff that do presentations as we have this morning. Uh, with us today is Sally Snyder. Good morning, Sally. Good morning, everybody. She is our coordinator of children and young adult library services here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And today she is doing her annual Best Teen Reads of 2021. This is something we do every year. We do a teen one and there is um, a children's uh, version of this too. Um, Best Children's New Best New Children's Books of 2021 that we did at the beginning early in December. The recording is on our in our archives. So if you are a youth librarian um, who handles any children of any age, um, you can watch the children's one and then for your younger kids, younger readers. And um, now we have the teen books that we're going to hear about today for the older ones. So I'll just hand it over to you, Sally, to take it away and tell us about all the great books we're going to be, they're going to be reading today. Or maybe we will. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just would like to mention that on the Library Commission's homepage, if you type up in the search box, mm -hmm. handouts, then it takes you to a link. Click on that link, and all of the handouts listed there so far are ones that I've given presentations on. So it's not it doesn't say Sally's hands out handouts. It just says handouts. So if somebody else ever decides to put theirs in there, that'll be fine. Mm -hmm. But you can find. Oh, go ahead. No, I was gonna say yeah. So that's where you can find the list of the list of all the books. And what I was gonna say was um, these will we'll have a link to that as well when we put the archive up. Um, for the show, um, a link to Sally's handout listing all the books and to the slide presentation that she's doing today with the book covers. That's true. And you, I haven't put up my comprehensive list of children's books, but I'm going to do that, I promise, today. So <laughs> okay. if you're looking for that, there's the one list of the presentation, but there's also my over, over the whole year, this is what I recommend of the things I've seen, which leads me into the teen list. These are books that we get as review copies here at the Library Commission. I call them my books, but they're not mine. They go to, when I'm through looking through them and reading them, they go to the library system coordinators, administrators, directors, and they are given to public and school libraries in the state. So um, I have them for a while and then they go out to libraries everywhere in Nebraska, which is great. Mm -hmm. So there's those books, there's books I've heard um, talk about and I find at the public library and occasionally I buy a book because the library doesn't have it and I want to read that book. So, and then I give it away to a nephew or great nephew or great niece or whoever, or put it in the giveaway stack. But that's where I see books and I go to websites and I go to um, people's blogs and, and see who's saying what about which books and there's still books I don't hear about. So oh, if you're so many books that are published, I, you possibly. <laughs> <laughs> so if your favorite book is not mentioned, send me an email and tell me, Sally, check out this book. 
and I'll see if I can find a copy of it. And, and it might end up being a Friday reads or something during the year, who knows? The other thing I want you all to know is I have a script because if I don't, I'll babble for three hours and you'll all leave and you'll say, I'll just look at her list later. I'm done listening to this babble. So this keeps me on focus and hits the key points I wanna make about the books. And also I'd like to say, if anyone has a comment about a book I'm talking about, like my teens won't check that book out. It's like it's uh, got the COVID virus on it or something. Then let us know because these are my opinions. I run things, some things by my great nephew who's 13 now. And um, he's he's my really only contact with teens and he just made that last November, it's about time. Anyway, so I'm gonna get started talking and let me know if, if teens love it or won't touch it or you had a great conversation with somebody about something you're welcome to um, raise your hand, or is there a way to raise their hand, right? There is, yep, um, if you want to. Um, you can also just type, they can also just go ahead and type into the questions section if they're, if they're thinking of anything. If you have a question about any of the books, you want to know more detail about something, um, or if you have a title so to suggest, as Sally said, uh, go ahead, write and type in the question section there, and I can grab that and um, read any of your comments off to Sally. That'll be great. So we'll just go ahead and get started now. I can make everything work. You're seeing my screen, right? Yes, yep, we see the full screen of the best teen reads of 2021 so far. Okay, well, I should have taken off the so far because that's okay. That's this is originally done at our state annual state library conference, Nebraska Library Association conference. That's why it has that and it says the October date there, but that's all right. I probably won't read that many more 2021 books because I'm looking forward to 2022 right now. So let's see if I can get this to move. Hello. There we go. We'll start with fiction for younger teens as a very general age range, I know, but we know that teens and children read widely away from their age group or their school um, grade. So I try to be pretty vague about things like that. We'll Parveen and her two close friends are starting high school. Just after the high school orientation for freshmen, Parveen's boyfriend of two days breaks up with her. He was her first boyfriend and she is devastated. Homecoming is in six weeks and she becomes obsessed with getting a date for the event to prove to herself and to her former boyfriend that she is desirable. She neglects her best friends while working towards this goal. There are plenty of other changes that come along as well in the book. Parveen, Parveen is struggling at times to adapt. Her mother is white and her father emigrated from Iran. She is eager for her aunt to visit from Iran, but that is in question due to the Muslim ban that had been put in place. So this is about change and adjustment, of course, starting high school, friendship, old and new, and realizing her neglect of her friends and apologizing for it. This is a full color graphic novel, and this particular uh, copy is a compilation of six separate chapters, so to speak. So when, if you want to get this, search for it by the ISBN so you're sure to call up this particular volume. Charlotte Grote was nominated for Teen Detective of the Year, 16 to 18 age group. And she attended the event in London with her friend and sidekick, Claire Little. While there, she was set up to be accused of attempted murder of another detective. He is in a coma now and cannot tell what happened to him. In the meantime, instead of preparing for college, Lottie is working with the police and living under house arrest. At first, they do things like send her to get tea for everybody and, you know, make copies of this paper. But over time, she does end up contributing to the force because she is an intelligent, sharp girl who catches things that the officers haven't caught. Still, ever on her mind is, will the victim wake up and clear Lottie's name? And this is a this particular edition is a complete story although there might be more stories about her in the future. A book, this is a book in free verse. Ellie, 12, has created her own fat girl rules and follows them to avoid being bullied, but she still is bullied every day. Catalina, the new neighbor girl her age, and her family accept Ellie as she is and value her. This acceptance and also her finally allowing her therapist some slack 
begin to encourage Ellie to speak up for herself. Her mother, older brother, and sister also bully her. Her father is the only one who loves her for who she is. You will cheer for Ellie as she works on speaking up, makes some mistakes, and not letting classmates or family members get away with it anymore. Um, we do have a, a kind of a question request, um, especially for this one. The, the barcode is like covering up part of the author's name. Yes. <laughs> I think it is. Sorry. But if you could read the title and author of the books then in case you, um, before. The, so I will be happy to do that. This, this author's first name is Lisa. Ah. When you get them from the library, you just don't know what they're going to cover up. <laughs> yeah, the fifth starfish, yeah. The title of this book is Alone by Megan E. Freeman. This is also written in free verse, set in Colorado in the near future, Maddie, 12, and her friends have planned a secret sleepover over at her grandmother's vacation apartment. The plans fall through, but Maddie stays there all by herself, kind of enjoying the silence. For During the night, she hears some trucks and some people moving around outside the apartment, but she falls back asleep. The next morning, everyone is gone. The TV says there was an imminent threat and everyone was evacuated. When she charged her phone, she saw many messages, but no one answered her calls or her texts. Soon the utilities are turned off and she has to find a way to survive. She is on her own for the next three years with her only company, George, her former neighbor's Rottweiler. They face or hide from weather, wild animals, looters, and more scavenging what they need, bottles of water, food, and wood to burn from homes and stores. Her younger brother was writing a book report on Island of the Blue Dolphins, and that title comes up a few times in this book. This is obviously about survival and depending on oneself, because that's all you have, and planning ahead for each season so you're ready for, or as ready as you can be for whatever comes. This is the second book about Beast Boy. Both Beast Boy and Raven, have, oh, it's a full color graphic novel. Both Beast Boy and Raven have chosen to travel to Nashville to meet up with the mysterious Slade who claims to be able to answer their many questions. It doesn't take long for them to run into each other and then discover that they are both in danger. This um, particular story arc somewhat completes, but it could carry on to further volumes. And interestingly, this is paperback. The hardcover comes out in April 22. This is by Cami Garcia, and it's Teen Beast Boy Loves Raven. So they did the soft cover before the hardcover? OK. Yes. <laughs> well, that's what it says on Amazon. <laughs> Would they be wrong? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> this is a full color graphic novel. This is book one of three. And it was intriguing because it's about the downfall of the planet Krypton being explored in these, this three book series. In the first title, we meet Zon L, a cousin of Laura, Superman's mother, who was concerned about the lack of effort to address the problems of the planet, like the ground quakes that appear to be getting worse. Sarah Ur, the girl, is a soldier for Krypton and she sees the hopelessness of the tribunes, those in power, to try to terraform a planet for their people to move to. It isn't working. Zahn and Sarah are thrown together to work for the future of Krypton. Well, we do have a comment that that one, um, uh, the Alone title, someone says this one has been very popular here in Norfolk. The Alone, the previous one. Oh, okay. Oh, thanks for letting me know. Glad it. This is A-OK -okay by Jared Green. It's a semi-autobiographical, full-color graphic novel. Jay starts eighth grade with a few pimples, but they soon get worse, and he begins a round of treatment with his dermatologist. Pimples aren't the only change. His best friend is now in a band and doesn't have much time for him. His classes are tougher, and he realizes he has never had a crush on anyone. Is he asexual? What is great for him, though, is art class. He can be himself there. The chapters are by each month of the school year and talks about school and home and his doctor appointments, taking the reader with him through the, through the year. Changes and preparation for high school. And there is humor in here and also um, some heartfelt issues that happen. The Curie Society by Janet Harvey. Three freshmen at Edmond University, Simone, Maya, and Taj are invited to join the Curie Society. 
Founded secretly by Marie Curie, the Society conducts meticulous research, such as their current de-extinction studies. Now the new recruits are asked to help their mentors uncover who has stolen their research. Science, a touch of James Bond-like equipment, and a fist or two now and then will keep them on track. It's good adventure and a respect for science and strong women. April Henry's playing with fire. Natalie, 16, and Wyatt have gone on a short hike to introduce Natalie to a favorite pastime of Wyatt's. It was less than two miles to the lake through a beautiful forested area, but when they try to hike back to the car, the area below them is on fire. They and the others at the lake have to hike higher and further into the night to try to escape. What Wyatt doesn't know and Natalie keeps quiet about for quite a while is that when she was 11, she accidentally started a house fire and her baby brother died from it. Periodically during the story, the author revisits what happened then and we continually learn more about what healing, both physical and emotional, Natalie has been going through to recover. So again, this is a survival story and about being prepared and caring for others and overcoming fear. Unplugged by Gordon Corman. Jet at 12 is a rich, spoiled brat and has now been sent to a place of wellness and meditation called Oasis for the summer. No phones, no TV, no electronics, vegetarian only. Jet is determined to get out of there. He manages to use the boat to get to town from time to time with no adult the wiser. But when he and a few others find an unusual lizard near the secret shack, they bound together to take care of it. Still, there is something weird about the estate-like house in the small town. Who lives there and what are the grounds like? Trouble is the answer and he's gonna get it into a pile of it. Gordon Corbin has another book titled Link. The students at the middle school in a small Colorado town are reeling. A swastika was found painted on the wall of the atrium area and everyone is shocked at this act of hatred. When more swastikas appear one at a time throughout the town, everyone wants the culprit named. Told from several different students' points of view, the impact on the town and the people in it is shared with the reader. In the town's past and brought to light again is the Night of a Thousand Flames, when the Ku Klux Klan lit crosses all around the town 40 years ago. Some people had denied that that ever happened. A meeting of students sparks a way for them to honor the six million Jews and other people who died from the Holocaust. Patterned after the paper clips project of Whitwell Middle School in Whitwell, Tennessee, the students plan to make a paper chain of six million links as a response to the swastikas. Red, White and Whole by Rajani La Roca. This is also told in free verse. Reha is 13 in eighth grade, was born in the United States. Her parents came here from India. Her parents want her to be a good Indian daughter and she tries, but she is American too. And she wants to do things that others in her school are doing. Then her mother becomes very ill. Reha is determined now to be the very best Indian daughter she can be. Maybe that will help her mother heal. Helping and hoping through her illness with leukemia and finally having to let her go is conveyed with heart and empathy. And the title Red, White and Whole refers to blood and blood cells because of the leukemia. The author said that at the end of the book. This is a sequel to Show Me a Sign. Mary, now 14, is pondering her future, what she wants, maybe teaching, and what is possible for her at this time. When a letter arrives from Nora offering her a chance to teach the deaf girl at the estate where she works. Mary goes and finds things very different than she expected. The girl is locked in an upstairs room and the butler who is in charge while the family is gone will not allow Mary to see her. Mary finds her way into the room and it is disgusting. The smell of excrement and the girl is chained by her leg to a leg of the bed. They cannot communicate and the girl is called feral by some of the others. Remembering her own captivity, Mary is determined to help this child. This is book five of the series, Emmy and Friends. It's a hybrid graphic novel with lots of white space with the text part. So there's text and then there's also graphic novel panels. Tyler is in seventh grade and discovers he loves being on the basketball team, but he also loves art. Does he have to fit into a slot? Also, he is friends with Emmy, but not boyfriend, girlfriend, why can't his buddies understand that and stop teasing him? Alternating chapters between Tyler and Emmy give insight into what each of them are dealing with and concerned about. 
This is the first book in the series that focuses on a male point of view, which is interesting, although Emmy has her say too. I resisted reading this book for a long time because the cover made me think of war and battle and I'm tired of that and I don't want to read that. This is a great book. I loved this book. Kasia, 18, don't has been a book by its cover. <laughs> That's right. I was waiting for somebody to say that. <laughs> oh, I just thought, no, I don't want to. Oh. Kasia is 18 and he is a prisoner of Brisa. He has been for three years and he is a survivor of the plague that struck down so many. Now he is on his way home. The 50 year war ended when King Rayan of Oliveras married Princess Jehan of Brisa. Cass res rescues the infant pr prince from drowning on his unannounced arrival at the home he shares with his older brother, Ventilas, Lord of the Keep at Palmerin. The royal family was staying at Palmerin to escape plague in the capital city and now are preparing to return to it since the plague has lessened. As Cass slowly tries to find his way back to himself in his home, a couple of mysteries arise. Who tried to kill the prince and why? And what secret is the queen hiding? because he's pretty sure she has some kind of secret. Bug and her mother have just lost Bug's beloved Uncle Roderick, her mother's brother, and they are both dealing with the grief. Their income is now at a low and they may need to do something drastic. Bug's best friend Moira believes they both need to take some time this summer before starting their first year at middle school to practice with makeup, buy new clothes, and think about boys. Bug is tired of trying to figure out how to be a girl. She would prefer if things stay the same, but she tries for her friend's sake. They live in a somewhat isolated farmhouse that has a number of nonviolent ghosts or spirits. Sometimes a door slams or Bug may encounter a cold spot, but she believes the ghosts basically ignore her. Then it seems a new ghost with an agenda has come to the house. It is harassing Bug and a bit scary. This book handles the three topics very well, the hauntings, the income issue, and Bug's problem with being a girl. By the end of the book, Bug has realized he is transgender and wants to identify as a boy, and his friend, best friend Moira and the other kids at school are fine with that. This is an own voices book as the author also was considered to be a girl until he asserted that he is male. Hot Heartstopper Volume 3. I all just heard that there's gonna be a Volume 4 coming out somewhat later this year. Nick and Charlie are part of a school trip visiting Paris during break. They are sharing a room with two other boys who each claim a bed, so Nick and Charlie cannot share a bed. Nick has accepted that he is bisexual and he has shared that with his mother. Most of the book is about the ongoing decisions and difficulty of coming out over and over again with family, then some close friends, then more friends, but which ones? It is exhausting. Things continue to grow between them though, and by the end of the book, they agree that while they greatly enjoy hugging and kissing and they love each other, neither is ready for more. Uh, someone did say that volume four is out, but they just got it at their library. Oh, it is. Oh, I have to go find it. Let's see, sorry. That's this, <laughs> this is by Rhiannon Richardson, The Meet Cute Project. Mia, African-American and a junior in high school, is quite busy with her swimming practice and meets, pressures to do well in her classes in anticipation of college, and helping her sister Samantha, a bridezilla, handle all the many details in planning her wedding. Then she gets the last blow. Sam tells her she has to find her own date for the wedding. Mia is not practiced in dating and she has no boyfriend, so her friends who love rom-coms each set her up for a meet cute with a guy to see if anything magical happens. It's fun with expected embarrassing moments. And Mia also does some growing and seeing things outside her own experience and opinions and realizing she hasn't been as helpful as she could have been to her sister, even if she is a bridezilla. This is from Orca. It's a high interest, more easily handled um, text. Kip couldn't face the funeral or the parents of his girlfriend who died from an accidental overdose when he was not with her. He's not using drugs. He ran away to Vancouver and lived on the streets until he decided to get himself together as a gesture to his deceased girlfriend. Things were going well until he lost his job and the room he was renting in the same day. He was despondent but decided to go back to the center that had helped him before. At the center, at that moment, a woman he knew had volunteered there before offers a room in her home in exchange for him doing a few chores every day. He is suspicious. It sounds too good to be true. 
but he agrees. It isn't until a teen shows up at the house and asks if her brother is around that he begins to see he may not be safe there. 17 authors contributed 18 short stories that are interconnected through the well-attended Spring Pow Wow in Ann Arbor, Michigan. The stories sometimes touch together, maybe just the dog from one story walking by a table in another, or a t-shirt of note in one story is noticed and mentioned in another to, to help you feel connected to all the people in the stories in the, in the book. When finished, the reader may feel like I did that they have attended the powwow and now know some of the people who were there. The second book about Shuri by Nick Stone. Shuri, 13, the younger sister of T'Challa, the king of Wakanda, must study for the upcoming tests on her training, continue her work inventing and protecting the kingdom, and does not have time to look for missing girls who probably just ran away or something. When her best friend and bodyguard, Kamara, asks her to look for a friend who is missing, she says yes, but she puts it on the back burner. Then Kamara disappears, and Shuri is certain it is foul play. This book has strong female role models, STEM proficient girls are missing, and the message that we should all care about each other. Some nonfiction. This first one is a full color graphic novel, graphic novel format. It is nonfiction. It's a history of the development of Tulsa, the growth of Greenwood, the black community of Tulsa, and the people who lived there. The horrible premeditated attack on Greenwood and its people is carefully detailed to include what happened without gruesome portrayals in the artwork. It ends with the rebuilding of Greenwood by the residents. It includes a timeline, and notes and sources. Joseph Bruchock has written One Real American, The Life of Ely S. Parker. Ely Parker attended General Grant during the Civil War and at Lee's surrender. He is the man Lee commented on by saying, I am glad to see one real American here, to which Parker replied, we are all Americans. This scene opens the book after which Bruchot goes back to give the history of Parker's family and his honor held in the Seneca Nation. Parker was well respected both among his people and among the white people. This biography starts slow, but it gains ground as the reader learns about his determination and also his ability to learn. He took on new things all the time. Fascinating. In the Shadow of the Fallen Towers by Don Brown, muted full color graphic novel, nonfiction, excuse me, as he did with the Great American Dust Bowl in 2013 and Drowned City in 2015, among others, he now addresses 9-11. As the subtitle says, the seconds, minutes, hours, days, week, months, and years after the 9-11 attacks. Just using quotes from survivors when possible, Brown covers the immediate aftermath of the collapse of the towers, as well as our country's response. It includes an afterward statistics, source notes, and bibliography at the back of the book. Apple Skin to the Core by Eric Gansworth. Using the word apple, a pejorative for Native Americans, red on the outside, white on the inside, he works to reclaim this word. He uses the Beatles' music as his structure to this memoir, touching again on Apple, the Beatles' Apple Records. He is an enrolled Onondaga member raised in the Tuscarora Nation. Confusing from its beginning, he tells of his grandparents who spent time in boarding schools and its effect on their lives. It is illustrated with his art and photographs, this is a blended memoir in verse and art that explores his life, his experiences, and his family. And it's an unusual approach to, to this, but it really works very well. I just got this book the other day and read it fast. This is the first book in what could be another series with John Lewis passing away recently. It could um, have take more time. This picks up after the end of March Book Three, beginning soon after the signing of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Lewis is struggling with several issues. His leadership of the Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee, requests for a stance on the war in Vietnam, the Watts riot and riots in Chicago, apartheid in South Africa, and the statements from some that nonviolence just doesn't work anymore. Sources are listed at the back of the book. This was published as an adult book, but several review journals also listed as interest to grades eight and up. So I, I, and I've read it, it really does fit in with the other books that have been written. This is his rememberings, or reminiscences um, memory, but also it is very well 
supported by um, source notes and facts and all of that in the back of the book makes it very clear he's just not you know making it up you know, it happened the way he says mm -hmm. erica moen and matthew nolan wrote let's talk about it this is a graphic no graphic novel format nonfiction. it is a straightforward explanation of body parts and how they function consent and how to ask for it what are gender and sexuality safe sex masturbation abuse and other topics related to these issues it includes numerous comic book style illustrations that include body parts and a wide variety of skin colors and body types it's an excellent resource for teens it is something teens need but where to shelve it is the question I'm sure you're thinking of right now because I sure thought about it it definitely has naked people in it and naked body parts but it is such good information so you need to at least be aware of this book and I know that with um, the what's the word I want the number of, of complaints about books and in, in yes thank you that this it begs to be chosen out from the crowd but it is an excellent book so they have um the two authors have a uh, maybe it's a website they have things online about all of this kind of thing as well so it might be better to find out about that anyway you needed to know about Oh, oops. I still am reeling from the loss of Gary Paulson. He was 82 or three, but still at the end of this book, he says, I wonder what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. Oh, well, I'll figure it out. And he didn't have as much time as he was hoping. This is a memoir in five parts. Many librarians have read or heard Paulson say that the library saved his life. Here, along with other tales of his childhood and young adulthood, the reader learns much more about the story behind this statement. Part four, titled 13, contains this story. It begins with, because it was safe there, in the library. Only three places safe. The library, moving through the alleys at night after hard dark, and best of all, the woods. Part one starts the book with his mother putting him at five years old on a train alone in Chicago for a total trip of about 800 miles to his relative's farm in Minnesota. We join Paulson as he encounters security and safety and love with his aunt and uncle, and he really thrives there. And then the opposite as his life changes on another person's whim with no consideration for his preferences or choices. Throughout his life, he found security, safety, and peace in the woods on his own. And anyone who's read Guts, and that's also about his life, there are different stories, in, mostly different stories in each of these books. So you don't think you've already read this one. Some fiction for older teens, Ace of Spades by Farida Abaka Ayemide. I don't know if I'm even coming close to the right pronunciation. This is a creepy book. And it's, kind of, it's hard to read, not in, well, I'll just tell you about it. Devin and Chiamaka are beginning their senior year at Nevius Private Academy. They are the only two black students in the whole school. Soon after they are named prefects that first day, things begin to fall apart. Someone who calls him or herself aces is surely, slowly sharing secrets, revealing information about one or the other of them. It goes from uncomfortable and embarrassing too threatening. Mm -hmm. Devin and Chiamaka at first ignore each other, then work together to try to discover who was doing this and why. It is told in alternating chapters between the two main characters. This book starts out sinister, sinister and soon becomes unbearable, somewhat reminiscent of the movie Get Out. Now, I haven't seen that movie, but the reviewers said that, and I've seen snippets of it, so I think they're right. The author explains at the back of the book that this is allegorical and she purposefully did not name a city as the setting for the book. So it could be anywhere there's a city in the US. School Library Journal says themes of systemic racism, structural white supremacy, microaggressions, class distinctions, and LGBTQIA identities 
will resonate with readers. And that was from the July 1st, 2021 review. So it's very well written. It's, it's uncomfortable, more than uncomfortable to read for me because I'm white and it's pointed purpose. It is allegorical, remember that. Okay, moving on to something much lighter. Anna, 16, has only a basic knowledge of English. She and her mother just moved to the U.S. from Argentina to rejoin her father, and Anna is starting high school as a junior. She soon discovers that people talk fast and use lots of idioms. I never really thought about how many idioms we use, but boy, is she right. There is plenty she does not understand. Her special class to improve her English at first seems useless. The teacher speaks only English and the other students in the class speak many languages. Slowly things get better and she begins to realize she likes two different boys. One is in her math class and the other is in her ESL class. A good look at the difficulties of learning English and how much someone wants to acquire that knowledge, though it takes time. Six popular authors write short stories that connect to a degree, each on black love found during a blackout in New York City. Guy and gal, guy and guy, gal and gal, depending on the story. The authors are Danielle Clayton, Tiffany Jackson, D. Jackson, Nick Stone, Angie Thomas, Ashley Woodfolk, and Nicola Yoon. It got star reviews in Booklist and Publishers Weekly, and I thought it was great. This is a full color graphic novel. Megan and Cassandra Cass are summer vacation friends for eight years. They both love art and spend lots of time drawing, painting, and finishing each other's art, which they find quite fun. Then when they are 13, Cass Cass's parents divorce and there is no more summer cottage. Three years later, Megan has convinced her parents to let her stay in New York City with Cass and her mother for three weeks while her parents go on to a small business owners convention in Philadelphia. Megan has her eyes opened as she and Cass reconnect and she gets a good look at who and where Cass is now, very different from where Megan is. But then, desperate to avoid disappointing her parents, Megan does something unforgivable. She may never see or share art with Cass again. Maisie by Melanie Crowder is set in the 1950s. Maisie has lived and worked on a farm near Fairbury, Nebraska all her life. She also has sung, danced, and acted her way through many local events. Her heart has been set on Broadway for years. Now she has graduated from high school and she is leaving her heart behind with her boyfriend, but she has to take her chance. She thought she knew how different things would be in New York, but she wasn't close. Audition after audition, she is told that she is not the right type, which she begins to realize means she's a little heavy, She's from Nebraska. She doesn't portray that sophisticated self. Then it comes, then comes what might be her big break. It will at least mean following her dream for a while longer. This is all inclusive of new friends and some not friends, a handsy show producer, trying not to lose herself, and there is acknowledgement of her talent. She is talented. Okay, this is pretty creepy because I'm a chicken. A high school junior at St. Clair Prep, Jake is the only black student in his grade. Add to that his ability to see the dead, who spend their time reliving their final moments and mostly ignore Jake. It still is hard to concentrate in school. Now, Sawyer Dune, who had committed a shooting at a nearby school and died, is determined to take over Jake's body so he can continue his spree. Jake's brother doesn't believe he sees such things and is not going to be any help but his two new friends may come through and help him get over this issue. For me, this is pretty scary. Bridget, 17, has read the Swords and Shadows fantasy series over and over. She knows them so well, the author, R.M. Halden, or Bob, hires her in secret to help him keep track of what he has said before as he writes the final book. One day, Bob wakes up with a bad headache in a strange room chained to a treadmill desk. There is a note telling him to get writing or else. He has horrible writer's block and is very late with his manuscript. 
When Bridget receives a strange email from him, she realizes he has been kidnapped and she may be the only one who can help him. I know right now you're thinking of King's misery, but this is different. There are similarities, but it's different. He's in on it. He thought this would work to get him over his writer's block. It, uh, it uh, doesn't really at first. I hope you're not mad at me for giving that away. This is a fun book. Isabel, 16, is quiet and has trouble hearing in noisy places. She has auditory processing disorder. And sometimes she feels that she is not heard as well. Isabel feels so lucky to be Alex's girlfriend, though he seems to want her to be friends only with his friends. One day she was enjoying being alone by herself by the bean in Chicago when she hears Alex and some of his friends coming by. She ducks through a dark door and she ends up accidentally signing up for an open mic comedy show. She didn't know, she couldn't understand what was being said to her. She does try her best, but she knows it was terrible. And when she's done, some young people in there invite her to their table. They bolster her confidence and soon she is spending time with them and comedy as Izzy V. It was freeing and people heard her. She looks forward to working on getting better. Keeping this secret from Alex and her family can only last so long. Her new friends think she is in college like they are. She is underage for being in bars that host the open mic events. When, were, when will her house of cards fall? And when will she realize Alex is controlling and abusive? This is set in 1821 in London. Prim, Primrose, wakes up on her 16th birthday, ready for her introduction to London society to begin right now, please. Instead, she is left home alone again while her mother and older sisters go off on a shopping trip. Her second oldest sister is getting married in two weeks, and that consumes her mother. Prim is told she must wait another year. So Prim and her best friend Olympia sneak off to visit the scandalous Vauxhall Gardens. They wear masks in order not to be recognized, but they are accidentally separated after a brawl. Trying to find Olympia, Prim is voluntarily escorted, not by her choice, by a gentleman she has encountered once before, but does not actually know. After several adventures, some with the gentleman and some without, Prim finds Olympia and together they return home. Now Prim must face the wrath of her mother and learns she will be sent to her ailing aunt's house in the country to be her companion for years. Is there any way to escape her fate? This is a Regency age adventure with romance, handling disappointment and appreciating friends and sisters. And it's a, a much lighter story than some of the other ones I've talked about. If you have some teens who are interested in that time frame, this is a good choice. Jay's Gay Agenda by Jason June. Jay is the only teen in his small Oregon town who was out as a gay person. Statistically, there should be at least 20 other gay teens in his high school, but he is alone. While watching his friends have dating firsts, first date, first kiss, etc., Jay decides he's going to write his gay agenda, all the firsts that he wants to have, and that starts with meeting another gay person. Then his mom gets a promotion, his dad is supportive, and they all move to Seattle. For Jay, it is an amazing change. As he begins to cross some things off his gay agenda, he realizes it is more complicated than just that. People's feelings matter too. His new gay guide, Max, has advice, but it may not be the best for Jay. As Booklist says, <coughs> excuse me, Jason June's debut is funny, sex positive, and has complex, incredibly real characters. Nubia, Real One by L.L. L. McKinney and Robin Smith, Nubia is fast and strong, really strong. She is black and her two mothers constantly remind her not to use her strength. They will only get her in trouble. They do want the best for her. Her two best friends, Lakeisha and Jason, want her to enjoy her summer, but that seems unlikely. She is in a convenience store for a refill when two robbers enter. She stays low as her mothers would want until a guy she likes is threatened and she throws the ATM at the robbers and then runs. No surprise to Nubia, a policeman finds her partway home and handcuffs her until he learns the two robbers were men. Then he releases her and tells her to stay out of trouble. Dealing with many things common in high school, like liking a guy and being awkward around him, Nubia must also deal with racism and keep in mind that if people learn of her abilities, they will likely be afraid of her. They will not see her as Wonder Woman. 
But when her best friend Keisha is threatened by her former boyfriend, Nubia finds a way to catch him out without violence. And it turns out Nubia is related to Wonder Woman. As School Library Journal says, no superhero collection is complete without Nubia. The Cost of Knowing by Brittany Morris, Alex is 16 and his brother Isaiah 12. They live in Chicago with their, with their aunt since their parents died in a car accident. Since that time, Alex can see the future of any item he touches, which can tell him too much. He avoids touching people or items whenever he can. He works at an ice cream shop and he has a great girlfriend, Talia. She is beginning to think he doesn't really care for her since he doesn't hug or hold hands. He hasn't told her anything about this. Now he has seen that his brother will die soon, but he doesn't know how. He can't change it, so he decides to make his last days the best they can be, and they go together to an outdoor concert on the night Isaiah will die. As Kirkus says, this portrait of black boys as sensitive, vulnerable, and complex is refreshing, unfolding within a powerful and provocative narrative about brotherly love and the insidiousness of racism. That's from their February 15th, 2021 um, review. And it's, it's um, I'll move on. A Cuban Girl's Guide to Tea and Tomorrow by Laura Taylor Namey. Lila Reyes has just graduated high school. And in this time, she has had a trifecta of loss, is what she calls it. Her beloved grandmother, who taught Lila all she knows in the kitchen, died unexpectedly. Her boyfriend of three years just broke up with her, and her best friend, who was going to college with her, instead left for two years in Africa. To shake her out of her losses, her family sent her to spend the summer at her aunt's hotel in England. Feeling and being out of place, she struggles to connect with others besides her aunt. And understanding English English is tricky. Her Cuban baking is exceptional, and that is what she falls back on until she can get home. She's just going to hang on until she can get home. But over time, she begins to find herself, her baking, and maybe a great guy in England. She begins to want to stay. But she's supposed to help with the, the restaurant back home. So she's torn. Uh, Sally. Yes. Um, Get back to the one, the cost of knowing. Um, someone has a question in here. Okay. Um, the author of that one is totally covered up with the doc. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Wait. Wrong page. Brittany Morris, M O R R I S. We are right. Brittany Morris. Sorry. I think I just babbled that off too fast. <laughs> Thanks for asking, though. Please ask when I don't give you what you need. I love this title, Charming as a Verb. And I also like this author. And I think everything I've read from him so far has been terrific. Henry Haltwanger, 17, a senior in high school living in New York, is actively charming. He does this on purpose, not to fool people, but to set them at ease. As a tall black teen, he is aware of the many possible different reactions to him from different people. He has a set of smiles he uses to put people at ease. The only person who does not fall for his charm is classmate Corin Troy. He doesn't understand why. Like most high school seniors, Henry's focus is on college applications. He and his father are set on him getting into Columbia University, though he does have some second choices. Waiting for an acceptance or a so sorry email is excruciating. His parents emigrated to the US from Haiti Dog walking is earning him some money for college, though it does take up much of his time. His mother once told him, many young people are charming as an adjective, but you are charming as a verb. I love this one too. Well, I love charming as a verb. This one is great fun as well. Oscar Olson is a high school senior and he wants school to be over. He knows his future and he is ready to get going on it. He has worked with his grandfather, Farfar, which is Swedish for grandfather, on the food truck since the summer after eighth grade. They are good at it. They work together very well, and he loves it. School does have its afternoons of independent study from foods, advanced pastry arts, and food one as teaching assistants. Here he can experiment and practice his skills. Until go-getter driven Lou, Mary Louise Messinger, brought him into her Girl Scout project to eliminate food waste. All of a sudden, he is buried in 
uneaten apples from the cafeteria with the charge to use them to make something delicious for consumption. What? They wouldn't eat it as an apple. What can be good about them? Not only that, but before he knows it, Lou is helping with the food truck. Graduate now, please. There's a lot going on in this book, but it's great. Creativity and skill, he really is where he needs to be. Friendship and family are all included. And lots of good food, makes you hungry. The main character whose name is never give, given, she, he or she is older than 16, tells of the family's usual, unusual summer at their beach house. It is usual until Kit and Hugo Gard Garden arrive to stay with their neighbors, Hope and Malcolm. Kit is personable and handsome. Everyone loves him. Hugo is off-putting and quiet, and no one knows what to make of him. This is a summer like no other, and the main character is ready for a first sexual experience. The Girls I've Been by Tess Sharp is another book I really, it's hard, but it's uh, so well written. Nora, 17, not her real name, was rescued from her con artist mother five years ago by her older half-sister, Lee. Nora was part of each con her mother planned and carried out. She was Rebecca, Samantha, Haley, Katie, and Ashley. Being each one taught her things that she will soon need. Five years of living with her sister, going to therapy, going to school. Her boyfriend, Wes, who is now her ex-boyfriend, may have taken some of her edge off or not. Nora West and Nora's new love, Iris, Nora is bisexual, meet at the bank to deposit the money they, their fundraiser has collected. <clears throat> Once in the bank, they find themselves in the middle of a bank rob robbery and things are not going well. There are two robbers, one the brains and the other is always quick to panic. Nora will need all of her skills to keep everyone safe, her friends, the teller, the guard, and a girl who was there waiting for her father. It's the summer before her senior year in high school. Nala lives with her aunt, uncle, and cousin. Imani is deeply involved with the Inspire Harlem movement and things are different between the cousins, though they used to be very close. Nala agrees to go to the talent show Inspire Harlem is putting on as Imani's birthday present. Once there, she finds herself in love at first sight with a new guy in the group. He's the MC for the evening. He is an activist, a vegetarian, and confident. Nala is none of those, but she pretends to be in order to see him again. Over time, her little lies become bigger and she knows she must tell him to the truth, but it is hard to do. Nala learns that being your self, best self includes self-love and forgiveness of mistakes. Her grandmother is one of her biggest supporters and she lets Nala know that she has work to do on herself. So again, this is about self-awareness and self-love, being honest and loving family and friends. And this is the last title on my list, but if you let me, I just have a couple new titles in series. These are both from the same series. This is book three. It's Fly Girls is the name of the series, and Noelle the Mean Girl by Ashley Woodfolk is book three. Noelle just broke up with her boyfriend, and she is under a lot of pressure, but can't talk to her friends about it because, well, she knows she is bisexual, and now she is pretty sure she is in love with Tobin, who already has a girlfriend. Over time, her friends call her on how much she is snapping at them and that she needs to figure out what she's going to do. It looks like all of this will be resolved in book four. Fly Girls, Tobin the It Girl, also by Ashley Woodfolk. Tobin plans to follow her music after graduation, not go on to college. Her mother disagrees, but Tobin is determined. She auditions to become the fourth girl in a successful local band, but there is some big competition for the spot. Her girlfriend, Ava, has not been around much, and Tobin finds herself thinking of Noelle. Where does her heart lie? And this book does bring the four book series to a conclusion. So thank you again. And are there any other questions or comments? Well, let's see, does anybody have any questions, comments, anything you want to hear more about, or any uh, title suggestions yourself? Right. Give you time to type in if you want to. Um, as we said at the beginning, for anyone who wasn't here right when we started off, uh, Sally does have on our website, uh, there's a handouts page you can search for. She will have her list of all her titles for this. Um, it will be, we will link to it and we'll have the slides available too when the recording goes up. 
So you'll have access to all of that afterwards as well. And I know people may not be thinking of a, or they're thinking of a book title, but they can't remember it right now. So go ahead and send me an email later and say, this is what I wanted you to, to know about, because yeah. that'll be good too. Even if it is a 2021 book, I'm still going to read it if you ask. Okay. If you say. <laughs> So Julie said you had some other books that to mention or books and series, or are you done? Or... This, this is it. I, I okay. had some others I was trying to get read, but I didn't get them done. But hey, there's only so much time. <laughs> That's fine. Um, yes, yeah, so someone, okay. So yeah, so you will have access to the list of all and this and the slides um, with the recording. Someone was asking about getting with the the book that was the title that was the beginning of the session. So yeah, we'll have all of that for you. Um, that's great. Doesn't look like anybody has any questions or additions or anything. So um, okay, I think that's fine. We'll wrap it up. I'm gonna actually, and I'll show you here. I'm gonna pull presenter control to my screen now. Okay. There we go. There we go. There we go. So great. and as Kelly mentioned, if you go anywhere on our website, if you go to the Library Commission's webpage, there's a search box up here. And if you type in handouts, that's the very first result that comes up. Perfect. And here you can see, um, here are Sally's, um, when we did the, there was the summer reading program titles for for this well, this year, now that we're in 2022, uh, the children's book session that was held earlier in December and today's best teen books of 2021. So um, this is the list that she used. And so you will um, can grab it right there if you want to. Well, I'll also have a link to this page when we do put up the recording for today's show. Um, as you can also see here, uh, I don't know if you would mention this, Sally, all of her previous ones from over the years. So if you want to look for some older titles you know they're still good books they just came out during these particular years we talked about taking some of the oldest ones off there just you know hiding them i don't know i mean that might make the page look less cluttered but yeah. well, no, it's good information still hey we'll get over to our encompass live page i'll show you so that will be available. Um, this is our Encompass Live website. If you go, use your search engine of choice and just type in Encompass Live, it's the only thing that comes up. So nobody else can use that name. Um, these are upcoming shows, but right underneath here is a link to our archive. And this is where today's archive will be posted. Should be up by um, sometime tomorrow. And I will email everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show. We'll get an email directly from me letting you know when it's ready. Uh, it'll be at the top of the list here, the most recent one to the top. There'll be a link to the YouTube recording, a link to the slides that Sally used with the book covers, and a link to that handouts page so you can have the actual um, PDF list there. Um, while I'm here, I'll show you this is our full archive. There's a search feature here that you can type in and um, look up for anyone or a presenter if you want to. Uh, here's that children's session, that's kind of a companion show that Sally does. Um, about the best new children's books of the year that we did a couple weeks ago. So as I said at the beginning, if you are the youth librarian and cover ages from beginning readers all the way up to the older, oldest teens, you've got that show and then today's show with the new titles for this year. Um, but you can do a search anything you want. Um, you can search the full show archives or just most recent 12 months if you want something just recently done. That is because this is our full show archive and I'm not gonna scroll all the way down because it's a really long list. Uh, it goes back to when Encompass Live premiered, which was in January 2009. So we are like 12-something um, years in, and we just have everything here. <laughs> so do pay attention when you do um, watch a recording to the original broadcast date. They all have a date there. Uh, some of the shows will stand the test of time. So be good information, good resources, and, and, and whatnot. But some things may become old and outdated. Um, services or programs may have changed drastically since the original show. Some links, some may no longer exist anymore. Um, links may be you no know, longer be correct. Um, but this is something we do as librarians, keep things for historical archival purposes. So we will always have our full archives here as long as you have somewhere to host them. Right now, that's all on our YouTube channel. So I just pay attention when you are watching any of our shows. 
Uh, we do have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. We have got it linked from our uh, website. Um, if you do like your Facebook, give us a like over there and get reminders. Here's a reminder about today's show, highlight our presenters, um, let what people know when recordings are available. So uh, do you know give us a like over there if you um, want to. We also post onto YouTube and Instagram, I believe, using our hashtag and come live with the duration. So if you want to, uh, you can just search for that elsewhere online. So that'll wrap it up for today's show. Um, I hope you join us next week when our topic is our 2020, 2022 One Book, One Nebraska title, The Bones of Paradise. Um, we did the website for the One Book One Nebraska just got upside updated since it's January, so we've got all our information on there. Um, the author Jonas D will be with us actually. She'll be joining us next week's show, so um, we get to hear from them. So that's great. So um, if you're interested in seeing what's going on um, with our new One Book One Nebraska title for 2022, uh, sign up for the next week's show and any of our other ones. So yeah, I've got January dates, then I've got some February starting. I've got other ones that'll be added to keep dry on our schedule as I add in um, new sessions that are coming up. Um, other than that, thank you very much everyone for being here with us today um, and we'll hopefully we'll see you on future episodes of Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.